All right. Yeah, Frank Zappa. This was actually sent to me a while ago from someone in France, but as it's Frank Zappa Day, I did actually mean to do it because the first one, boy, did I go off. So if you haven't seen that, it's an interview which I'm guessing would be around the same time as this because, yeah, it was about the same subject, rock lyrics. So it's Frank Zappa at PMRC Senate hearing on rock lyrics. So, yeah, this could make me go off again because censoring language is a very big topic to me. I don't think that if you've if you're out there fighting for equality for any cause then getting words banned isn't the fucking um right way to go about it. Just banning words it doesn't mean anything. Like yeah. So if you are out there fighting and you think that that is the answer then yeah, let me tell you it ain't. But um yeah, so I do disagree with the banning of any words under any circumstances. Uh, so this could set me to go off but yeah let's go let's see what Frank Zappa has to say well, I really kind of know because I watched the crossfire and he was pretty G there but this is him doing the Senate hearing so yeah let's go the next witness will be Mr. Frank Zappa <clears throat> Quite good to see him all suited. He looks well different. He is very. Uh, he looks like a lawyer from a movie, all suited and booted. Mr. Zappa, thank you very much for being with us. Please proceed. Okay, my name is Frank Zappa. This is my attorney, Larry Stein, from Los Angeles. Can you hear me? Could you, if you could speak very directly and clearly into the microphone, I'd appreciate it. Okay, my name is Frank Zappa. This is my attorney, Larry Stein. Um, the statement that I prepared that I sent you 100 copies of is five pages long, so I have shortened it down, and I'm going to read a condensed version of it. Certain things have happened. Uh, I've been listening to the uh, event in the other room, and I've heard some conflicting reports as to whether or not people in this committee want legislation. I understand that Mr. Hollings does from his comments. Is that correct? I, I think you better concentrate on your testimony rather than asking questions the, of the The reason committee, I need Mr. to ask Seppel. it because if it I have to change something in my testimony if so, if there is not a clear-cut version of whether or not yeah. legislation is what is being discussed here. So Do the best I you mean, can, because I, I don't think anybody here can characterize Mr. Holl Senator Holland's position. Okay. Well, I'll carry on with the, uh, the issue then. Sure, First thing I... I might help out, you know, just a little bit, but I might, but I can't get paid. Yes. This is one senator that might be interested in legislation and or regulation uh, to some extent uh, recognizing the problems with free right of expression and my previously expressed views that I don't believe I should be telling other people what they have to listen to. Mm -hmm. But I really believe that the suggestions made by the original panel was some kind of an arrangement uh, for voluntarily policing this in the music industry is the correct way to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it'll help you out in your testimony, uh, I might join Senator Hollings and uh, or others in some kind of legislation and or regulation unless the free enterprise system, uh, both the producers and you as the performers, uh, see fit to clean up your act. Okay, thank you. Then I 
Okay, so that's hardly voluntary. Uh, first thing I would like to do, because I know there is some foreign press involved here, and they might not understand what the uh, issue is about. One of the things the issue is about is the, the uh, First Amendment to the Constitution. And I it's short, and I'd like to read it so they will understand. It says, Congress shall make no, no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. That's for reference. These are my personal observations and opinions. I speak on behalf of no group or professional organization. The PMRC proposal is an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which fails to deliver any real benefits to children, infringes the civil liberties of people who are not children, and promises to keep the courts busy for years dealing with the interpretational and enforcemental problems inherent in the proposal's design. It is my understanding that, in law, First Amendment issues are decided with a preference for the least restrictive alternative. In this context, the PMRC demands are the equivalent of treating dandruff by decapitation. <laughs> no one is forced, Mrs. Baker or Mrs. That's a great analogy. That's a great analogy. Yeah. Or to bring Prince or Sheena Easton into their homes. Thanks to the Constitution, they are free to buy other forms of music for their children. Apparently, they insist on purchasing the works of contemporary recording artists in order to support a personal illusion of aerobic sophistication. Ladies, please be advised, the 898 purchase price does not entitle you to a kiss on the foot from the composer or performer in exchange for a spin on the family Victrola. Taken as a whole, the complete list of PMRC demands reads like an instruction manual for some sinister kind of toilet training program to housebreak all composers and performers because of the lyrics of a few. Ladies, how dare you? The lady's shame must be shared by the bosses of the major labels who, through the RIAA, chose to bargain away the rights of composers, performers, and retailers in order to pass H.R. 2911, the blank tape tax, a private tax levied by an industry on consumers for the benefit of a select group within that industry. Is this a consumer issue? You bet it is. The major record labels need to have H.R. 2911 whiz through a few committees before anybody smells a rat. One of them is chaired by Senator Thurman. Is it a coincidence that Mrs. Thurman is affiliated with the PMRC? I can't say she's a member because the PMRC has no members. Their secretary told me on the phone last Friday that the PMRC has no members, only founders. I asked how many other DC wives are non-members of an organization that raises money by mail, has a tax-exempt status, and seems intent on running the Constitution of the United States through the family paper shredder. I asked, if, I asked her if it was a cult. Finally, she said she couldn't give me an answer and that she had to call their lawyer. While the wife of the Secretary of Treasury recites, gonna drive my love inside you, and Senator Gore's wife talks about bondage, an oral sex at gunpoint on the CBS Evening News, people in high places work on a tax bill that is so ridiculous, the only way to sneak it through is to keep the public's mind on something else. Mm. Porn rock. Is the basic issue morality? Is it mental health? Is it an issue at all? The PMRC has created... I love he said that. I love that he said that. And that he sees through the fucking smoke screen of fucking modern day topics. And modern day talking points and what you see on the news. Shit that doesn't matter when underneath every all of that things get passed and you're not even fucking aware of it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. This is great so far. Let's go. A lot of confusion with improper comparisons between song lyrics, videos, record packaging, radio broadcasting, and live performances. These are all different mediums, and the people who work in them have a right to conduct their business without trade restraining legislation whipped up like an instant pudding by the wives of Big Brother. Is it proper that the husband of a PMRC non-member founder person sits on any committee considering business pertaining to the blank tape tax or his wife's lobbying organization? 
Can any committee thus constituted find facts in a fair and unbiased manner? This committee has three that we know about, Senator Danforth, Senator Packwood, and Senator Gore. For some reason, they seem to feel there is no conflict of interest involved. Children in the vulnerable age bracket have a natural love for music. If, as a parent, you believe they should be exposed to something more uplifting than sugar walls, support music appreciation programs in schools. Why haven't you considered your child's need for consumer information? Music appreciation costs very little compared to sports expenditures. Your children have a right to know that something besides pop music exists. It is unfortunate that the PMRC would rather dispense governmentally sanitized heavy metal music than something more uplifting. Is this an indication of PMRC's personal taste or just another? To be fair, America has always tried that. That's why. <clears throat> to be honest, that's why the British bands um, took over in the 60s. Because all the American bands from like the 50s and that, that couldn't get airplay over there were still played on pirate radio stations over here from radio stations, American radio stations, like people could still get radio stations since the war. For the, that the was put here for American soldiers while they was over here to listen to their radio. And then people in them, back in the 50s, which is like, yeah, so like 15 years after, uh, English people, people like John Lennon and Paul McCartney and Ray Davis and Keith Richards, they was here in Howling Wolf and Chuck Berry and uh, Buddy Holly and all these things and I think this is another thing that's quite interesting about the English side of it is the colour thing it didn't really come into it because they didn't know they had no they didn't know, know what the fuck that was coming through them speakers they never heard anything like it they didn't know anything about them people until they started to research them but they just knew they liked that thing and then yeah um, but the reason why the British bands took over in the 60s is because, yeah, uh, the American government was doing everything they could to keep black music away from the population. So really, the Beatles and all these bands had a kind of advantage of the fact that we don't have that here. And also, the other thing is, is that the, the rock and roll songs that was so rude or whatever to be played in America, really, the English was pirate in it, so the government was in control of it, even if they wanted to be. They were just tuning into local army bases and army barracks where that was sending the signal. But yeah, it's funny America has tried that a lot, and it's funny that they're trying it now. Well, then. I think for then throughout time, people, governments always try it. It's banning words. And this is why I'm so against the banning of words. Because you're getting it in our country now. The second you ban one word, you, all you're doing is giving the government power. More power than they should have, an intrusive power. And yeah, all right, maybe the word that got banned is something that you actually wanted banned. But then it rolls around to the point where, like, we are in a point now where, like, a man I saw in Starbucks, um, someone, I can't remember who was saying it, he was saying he went into Starbucks, this man said he went into Starbucks with his wife. His wife's very shy. He knows this. He's like, and I do tell her if she has to get over that. But she doesn't. He's like, so I know that when we go into the restaurant, she doesn't like to talk to the waiter. He said, I, so I do. She'll either tell me what she wants, and I'll say, or I even, or I know. Like, if we go in, like it says, if we go in Starbucks, I know what she wants. So she doesn't even have to tell me. He said, so we walk up to the counter. The man says, I will have blah de blah and my wife will have blah de blah And the person behind the counter says, uh, it's partner, not wife. Because wife 
is a symbol of male ownership over women. So that's where we're at now. We're at the point that a man ordering something for his shy wife is actually told he can't call his wife his wife. That's the power you gave the government. That's the power you gave. And I know it's not the government implementing it, but it is. Once one thing buckles, they all buckle, all companies buckle. <clears throat> and it is, you should, right, yeah. I'm not getting found in any word. Manifestation of the low priority this administration has placed on education for the arts in America. The answer, of course, is neither. You can't distract people from thinking about an unfair tax by talking about music appreciation. For that, you need sex, and lots of it. The establishment of a rating system, voluntary or otherwise, opens the door to an endless parade of moral quality control programs based on things certain Christians don't like. What if the next bunch of Washington wives demands a large yellow J on all material written or performed by Jews in order to save helpless children from exposure to concealed Zionist doctrine? Record ratings are frequently compared to film ratings. Apart from the quantitative difference, there is another that is more important. People who act in films are hired to pretend. No matter how the film is rated, it won't hurt them personally. Since many musicians write and perform their own material and stand by it as their art, whether you like it or not, an imposed rating will stigmatize them as individuals. How long before composers and performers are told to wear a festive little PMRC armband with their scarlet letter on it? Bad facts make bad law and people who write bad laws are, in my opinion, more dangerous than songwriters who celebrate sexuality, freedom of speech, freedom of religious thought, and the right to due process for composers, performers, and retailers are imperiled if the PMRC and the major labels consummate this nasty bargain. Are we expected to give up Article One so the big guys can collect an extra dollar on every blank tape and 10 to 25% on tape recorders? What's going on here? Do we get the vote on this tax? I think that this whole matter has gotten completely blown out of proportion, and I agree with uh, Senator Exxon that there is a very dubious reason for Yeah, if we go back a bit, I think the point he made just a minute ago, I think what he was saying was the same thing Jim Norton says about it. Now it's comedy. At a minute it's comedy that people are going after and, sent, uh, and wanting to censor, and it's comedians that are getting attacked and thrown under the bus and all the rest of it. But... Um, I saw Jim Norton on a show debating a feminist about rape jokes and in that he said I think she had Jeff Goldblum, is that his name? He said to her, you don't like, you think rape jokes should be banned and no one should be allowed to say rape jokes. He says, but however you have Jeff Goldblum as your profile picture and in the f one of his first movies or his first movie there's a vicious violent rape scene in that movie so how is it okay when uh, actor acts it which that would be more triggering if someone was to watch that film and would experience that to have a real violent display of that dis like not in a joking way in a real way, being active real, that's gonna trigger someone a lot more than a joke. But the acting's fine, when an actor acts like that, it's, it's art. But if a comedian makes a joke, which is his art, it's his version of the art, it's his version of taking a subject like a movie does, will take a subject and then put whatever message in it or whatever. But a comedian does the same thing in his way. So by saying he shouldn't make rape jokes, really you should say that in any film that has rape in it, they should all be banned too. It has to be across the board otherwise, and then not only that, because then if you ban rape jokes, right, rape, rape offends you. But then it's alright, alright then, well then if you're going to ban that, then you ban race jokes, then you ban gay jokes, then you ban any joke that offends someone. 
if someone out there gets offended by a joke, then you ban that topic. Because you only want to ban a certain thing because it affects you. You're fine about all the other things. You'll laugh at jokes about race or about gays. But when it comes around to, say, rape, then that's a subject that touches you. And then, oh, you can't joke about it. Despite the fact you've just sat there and laughed about two subjects that would trigger somebody else and that's ultimately another reason why you can't make laws out of words because everybody's opinion is different when it comes to it not everybody thinks the same not all women think the same not all black people think the same not all white people think the same so to like say everybody in this race thinks this so this has to happen is racist in itself because I can guarantee you not everybody did and it's like why do they get more this is what I mean it's personal opinion a lot with a lot of this stuff it's your personal views and you can't make laws based off personal views but yeah let's go having this event and I also agree with Senator Exxon that you shouldn't be wasting time on stuff like this because from the beginning I have sensed that it is somebody's hobby project now I've done a number of interviews on television and people keep saying, can't you take a few steps in their direction? Can't you sympathize? Can't you empathize? I do more than that at this point. I've got an idea for a way to stop all this stuff and a way to give parents what they really want, which is information, accurate information as to what is inside the album without providing a stigma for the musicians who have played on the album or the people who sing it or the people who wrote it. And I think that if you listen carefully to this uh, idea, that it might just get by all of the constitutional problems and everything else as far as I'm concerned. I have no objection to having all of the lyrics placed on the album routinely, all the time. But there is a little problem. Record companies do not own the right automatically to take these lyrics because they're owned by publishing companies. So. Just as all the rest of the PMRC proposals would cost money, this would cost money too, because the record companies would need, they, they shouldn't be forced to bear the cost of the extra expenditure to the publisher to print those lyrics. Um, if you consider that the public needs to be warned about the contents of the records, what better way than to let them see exactly what the songs say? That way you don't have to put any kind of, of subjective rating on the record. You don't have to call it R, X, D, A, anything. You can read it for yourself. But in order for it to work properly, the lyrics should be on a uniform kind of a sheet. Maybe even the government could print those sheets. Maybe it should even be paid for by the government if the government is interested in uh, making sure that people have consumer information in this regard. And. Uh, you also have to realize that if a person buys the record and takes it out of the store, once it's out of the store, you can't return it if you read the lyrics at home and decide that little Johnny is not supposed to have it. I, I think that that should at least be considered. And the idea of imposing these ratings on live concerts, on the albums, uh, asking record companies to reevaluate or drop or um, violate contracts that they already have with artists should be thrown out. That's it all. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Zappa. You and Before it goes round, <coughs> uh, I was thinking it's funny how they say that in, uh, he's in the Bible where it says, um, those who are last will one day be first, and those who are first will one day be last. Something like that. And you kind of see it with this. You can see in these days, and what these artists was fighting about was against conservatives. This is conservative views, sex, because they're religious and, and, and sex and that kind of thing is seen to be dangerous. And you can see, but now the revolt, the roles have reversed. I find that so interesting that, yeah, the Bible was right about that too. Well, that might not be the direct quote, but it's something like that. So, yeah, but yeah, that's right understand that uh, the uh, the previous witnesses were not asking for legislation and uh, I don't know I can't speak for <coughs> Senator Hollings but I think that the prevailing view here is that nobody's asking for legislation the question is just 
focusing on what a lot of people perceive to be a problem and you've indicated that you at least understand that there is another point of view yeah i do and that there are people who think that you know parents should have some knowledge of what goes into their home all along my objection has been with the tactics used by these people in order to achieve the goal i just think that the tactics have been really bad and the whole premise of their proposal they, they were badly advised in terms of record business law they were badly advised in terms of practicality or uh, they would have known that certain things don't work mechanically. He's actually really good. Oh, what's his intelligent like? What's his? Did he go to university and all that shit? Because he's very. He's not. He's not a dumb musician. He's not a dumb rock star. Like a, just a rock star who got into it because yeah. And he's even doing the thing of, under, seeing this other side of it, like and understand the other side of it. And that when you're debating, that's such a powerful thing to do. Instead of just going back and forth and just bang, bang, arguing, arguing, arguing. The power in saying, I do respect your view. I do respect what you think. I don't agree with what you think and I don't agree with it. Or I don't think you should do it this way or I don't think this, but like... But I can I respect it and I can understand it and I can see it and I get it. I just don't agree with it. Um, yeah, I like that. It's very powerful. That is, it's very powerful when you're debating someone and trying to get someone to listen to your ideas. Is to actually give their ideas like give them the idea that you actually value what they have to say. Otherwise, you if you're both just going off of you don't give a fuck and you've just argued it just. It never goes nowhere, but literally just that thing of saying, look, I value your point of view. I don't think you shouldn't have your point of view. And I like, oh yeah, like he said, I just think the tactics was wrong. I don't think it is bad like what you're doing or, or that you're doing it from, but the tactics that you're going, the way you're going around it is just bad. It, it is, I don't agree with it. So I, I, I really respect that. It shows a level of maturity in him that the average rock star just wouldn't have. The average rock star couldn't sit here and have this thing. You can see he's a very, very smart man. And he knows as well how to deal with people. So yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, that's great. What they sub uh, suggested. Senator Gore. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I found your statement very interesting, and uh, let me say, although I disagree with some of the statements that you make and have made on other occasions, I have been a fan of your music, believe it or not, and I, I uh, respect you as a true original and, and a tremendously talented uh, musician. Do you see? I watched the um, George Galloway, and maybe it was a different subject, and he was more being called out for something, but... It was a lot more aggressive. By him saying, I do appreciate your view. I do appreciate, you can see straight away, he said to, for example, I'm a fan of your music. I'm a fan of what you do. I'm a fan of the fact that you're an original. And it's like, if he'd have come in there with a different attitude and said, if you fucking dumb, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, then that man probably wouldn't have said that. And he wouldn't have had that friendly thing. But the fact, I'm telling you, the fact that Frank Zappa just said, I respect it, I respect you. I'm not coming from a like a fuck you thing, I'm just saying I don't I don't agree. But yeah, let's go. Your suggestion on uh, printing the lyrics on the album is, is a very interesting one because the uh, PMRC at one point uh, said they would uh, propose either a rating and or, or warning or printing all the lyrics on the album and and the record companies came back and said that they uh, that that they didn't want to do that but i think an awful lot of people agree with with your suggestion that one easy way to solve this uh, problem for parents would be to put the actual words there yeah. so that uh, parents could could see them in fact the national association of broadcasters made exactly the same request of the of the record company so 
I think your suggestion is uh, is an intriguing one and might really be a solution for the but problem. The prob well, you just have to understand that it does cost money because you can't expect publishers to automatically give up that right, which is a money-earning yeah. right for them. Somebody's going to have to reimburse the publishers. The record industry is going to, without trying to mess up the album jacket art and impose the, that lyrics only be printed on the back, it should be a, a sheet of paper that is slipped inside the shrink wrap that when you take it out, you can still have a complete album package. So there's going to be some extra cost for printing it. But as long as people realize well, that for this kind of... Very, very smart man. Off oh, so much <coughs> respect for this man. Very, very smart man. From how he just come across the end from saying because he he's not just coming from the artist side of it. He's also coming from the businessman side and and the music industry and the publishers. You can't expect the publishers to change something that they have a like a right to. So they will have to be reimbursed for that. But instead of that, why don't the publishers just print a new thing that can be slipped into side of new albums, therefore the original album doesn't have to be messed with, nothing has to be re-edited, and no one has to get paid. You just now pay the publishers to print a new thing. Genius. And I love the fact that he... This, this, He's like, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Consumer <clears throat> safety, you're going to spend some money, and as long as you can find a way to pay for it, I think that would be the best way to let people know. Well, uh, you know, I don't disagree with that at all, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the separate sheet would also solve the problem with the cassettes as well, because you don't have the, uh, the space for words on the cassette packs. And I, well, that I would have to be a little accordion fold then. then. Yeah, it was a, something like that. And... Uh, or, 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 or just fold it, <laughs> but, uh... He like that. He got a chuckle at. She didn't. She not even listening. She is not paying attention. She don't give a shit. He had a little chuckle. But, uh, a very large percentage of the uh, albums now sold are, are, are sold in cassette form. I've li listened to you uh, a number of times on this uh, issue, <laughs> and, uh, I guess the question that, that, that I really want to get from you is, or, or, or the, the, uh, the statement that I want to get from you is, is on whether or not you feel yeah. that the concern is, is legit. I need to stop here, so I'm going to charge my laptop. But if I go back to, say, let's say I come back at 16, no, nah, I'll come back at 16.20. Let me go back now. I have to charge my laptop if only just noticed. I had 40%. I thought that'd be alright to do this video. Nope. Yeah. So we're at 620. I'm loving this now. Because I'm loving that he, uh, he's handling it really well. Like, really well. Very maturely. Very playing their way. Not being an obnoxious rock star. He just wants to say rude things. And I, yeah, fuck you, I'll, I'll do what I want, so yeah. Definitely good watch so far. Um, but yeah, that's part one. Sweet.